All right, so this is ME344S, the HPC AI uh, summer seminar series. Um, I'd like to welcome, welcome you. This is the uh, first year that we've uh, offered this. Um, and the series is brought to you by the Stanford High Performance Computing Center and also the HPC AI Advisory Council. Um, the HPC AI Advisory Council um, is a community effort support center um, for end users. Um, so it's made up of people like me who uh, uh, donate time. Uh, I uh, am one of the uh, um, co-chairs of the Stanford Conference, which is the only uh, US-based conference. There are six conferences worldwide each year that we host. Um, and then I also run a HPC for the rest of us session at Supercomputing, and then also during the Stanford HPC AI Adv Advisory Council Conference. Um, for more information on that, you can go to hpcadvisorycouncil.com. Um, so I'm honored to welcome Horst Simon today. Um, he's from um, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, um, where he serves as the uh, deputy director. Um, he's a internationally recognized expert in computer science and applied mathematics. And if you've ever happened to have been awarded a top 500 certificate, uh, um, his name is one of them that is signed on the bottom of it. Uh, so he uh, was a member of the NASA team that developed the NAS Parallel Benchmarks, a widely used standard for evaluating performance of massively parallel systems. Um, and he's also the co-editor of the biannual uh, top 500 list that tracks the most, super, uh, most powerful supercomputers in the world. So with that, I'd like to welcome Horace. Thank you, Steve, and good afternoon. And let me get my laptop going. Yes. All right, uh, uh, Steve, thank you for inviting me to Stanford. I have, as uh, Steve reminded me, given a class here sometime maybe 10 years ago, so it's about time that I come back, even though I'm very close by. Uh, I just want to put this a bit in context since this is summer school and you might, I, this is not an in-depth uh, class, it's just a, uh, my observations about high performance computing and AI. I'll discuss a couple of current trends and I'd like to make this a very lively interactive class so please interrupt me. And you'll also get opinions from me and I'll try to say this is an opinion, this is a fact. Uh, um, so if I say something which is maybe not founded in backup uh, papers or scientific results, I will say so, but please do challenge me because you learn most when you think about the material and make comments about it. So what I want to talk about is supercomputing and superintelligence. And I was very much, uh, in a sense, driven to use the title by the famous book of Nick Bostrom on superintelligence, which made quite a bit of impact in the intellectual community. But actually, the one thing that recently made a lot of impact was the success that we had in terms of the uh, DeepMind uh, AlphaGo that first uh, launched a, the mo first successful computer game winning Go against the world champion. That was in 2016. And then in 2017, they published a result which was basically that the uh, AlphaGo program learned how to uh, basically play Go by playing to itself. So this was a huge accomplishment because Go was always considered to be a very difficult uh, game to master. And so this in itself was a major milestone in the last two years. And so consequently, you got a lot of public opinions here and I think Bostrom's book uh, catalyzed this, although he is not saying 
exactly what some of the uh, luminaries here are stating. And what all the luminaries are saying here is, is that they're very much concerned about uh, what's happening in the, H in, in the AI world. That is, we're maybe ushering a catastrophe. And this is sort of not just the robots taking over our jobs, but taking our life and the planet as we know it. And I was uh, sort of always skeptical about these doomsday scenarios. And I said, there's one thing I know about, and this is the high performance computing piece of this. And so I'll talk about high performance computing and supercomputing and uh, how that relates to the AI world. So where are we in terms of supercomputing? Here you see some of the supercomputers of the day. I'll talk a little bit more about this. And what is a supercomputer? There's a very simple definition, and this is at any given point in time, it's the most powerful computers that are out there for solving scientific and engineering problems. And that's a definition that's holding pretty much steady for history. And of course, it doesn't mean that these are the absolute most powerful computers, because you know that some of the large uh, companies like, I say, Google and Amazon may have more powerful computers, but they are not used for solving science and engineering problems. So the interesting thing is, is that in the popular discussion about AI, these most powerful computers are very much absent. They're not very much considered. And I'd like to talk a bit about the interaction between these two different technology streams where there should be actually more interaction. So if you look at uh, supercomputing, there is this uh, current push towards exascale computing. And this is an exaflop, R 10 to the 18 floating point operations per second. So this is a pretty much arbitrary marker which has been set out there because we had teraflop. And, mm, well, when I started out, we were talking about megaflop to gigaflop and then gigaflop to teraflop computing the 90s and then teraflop to petaflop computing the 2000s to 2010. And now we're in the day, in the times to going from uh, peta to exa. And each time is a factor of 10 to the 3. So, the important thing is, if you look back for 30 years, and I'll say a little bit more about it, is that high performance computing, these most powerful computers, have been growing exponentially in terms of their computational power over uh, the time that supercomputing was an active field, which is now more than 30 years. Anyway, this is now a worldwide uh, competition. So there are exascale projects, not just in the US, but there are projects in China, in Japan, in Europe. And the importance of this technology for industrialized societies is very clear. And in the US, it's driven very much by defense applications, but it's also uh, for scientific research an important technology and also for economic competitiveness. And so that's why you see, for example, in China, huge investments in supercomputing for its technology where China would like to compete just like in many other technologies in the computing field like AI and uh, quantum computing. So if you look, this is a bit of a complicated slide at the US Exascale Computing Project, ECP. This is a project that is now almost a decade old and where you see a number of systems listed here. Uh, when they arrive and you see that in 21 there is the system Aurora that will be installed at Argo National Labs which is probably going to be the first exaflop system, real exaflop system in the US and then in 22 there will be another system installed at Oak Ridge National Lab called Frontier uh, that will be the second exaflop system in the US and then there will be one in Livermore at our colleagues here in the East Bay that will follow soon after. So in the early 2020s, you will see some of those exaflop systems coming. And there are many other systems leading up to these. And that is the traditional world, the high end of high performance com computing and supercomputing. So this was just an introduction. What I want to do in my lecture is three things. Talk about current trends in supercomputing and talk about the path to exascale and beyond. And then talking about computing in the brain. And then 
uh, talk about what I think is probably hopefully while you're still around and uh, active, engaged, we uh, hope to get a lot of discussion about what computers still can't do. <coughs> so let me start out with a top 500 list. This is a project that I've been involved with since 1992 which was a hobbyist effort at that time to list the 500 most powerful supercomputers measured on the high-performance LINPAC benchmark that my colleague Jack Don Guerra from the University of Tennessee and Oak Ridge National Lab has, uh, is maintaining and is publishing, which is a very simple thing, which is just solving uh, dense linear systems of equations. Sorry. And uh, this, there has been a publication of this top 500 list twice a year over the last uh, now more than uh, 20, well, we have almost 50 lists, more than 25 years. And the important thing is, is that this list in a field that is growing exponentially has given a good measure of understanding where we have come and where we're going and in particular understanding performance trends. So. Uh, this is my dear colleague Hans Moyer, who passed away in 2014, who was really the person who invented this. So, if you look at the top 500 list today, these are the top systems in the world, and uh, they are listed here. So, you can see who is building these. So, the first two systems are IBM with NVIDIA. These are the two systems at Oak Ridge and Livermore that have been just installed within the last two years, then the number system three and four are Chinese systems. Number five, the reason it's yellow is that's a fairly new system that was just installed this year in 2019 at the University of Texas. And then there are more systems that are listed there. And I think what you want to look at here is, is that the amount of parallelism on those systems in terms of a number of cores is in the millions and you see in the last column, what is also important is, is that they are very power hungry systems. So uh, a big system, the top system now requires 10 megawatts or more. And so, well, 10 megawatt is always very difficult to appreciate, but you can always do a very simple calculation and say 10 megawatts is about $10 million a year in electricity bill. So these systems that are listed here probably cost of the order of $100 million or more to buy and then cost of the order of $10 million a year more or less, depending of course where you are in the country, of electricity bills. So these are huge systems and big investments. And um, what you also see is, is this column here, the second column from the right, this is the performance on this LINPAC benchmark. So you see that they are in petaflops. So they are at uh, about 100 to 150 petaflops for top systems. So we're still about a factor of 10 away from the exaflop. And this is actually still a significant hurdle. So I think it's quite of a challenge to get that factor of 10 in the next uh, two or three years, which is the ambition. So that's where we're today and I will just you, you will have the slides, they are posted so you can look at them. These, these are some details on the first four systems on the list. Um, this is Summit at Oak Ridge, this is Sierra at Livermore, and uh, this is the Taihu Light System uh, in China. So the interesting thing about this system is, is that it is a Chinese built system with native Chinese technology, which is very important because most of the other systems depend, depend on American technology. So you'll see that Intel processors are very much dominating the list, for example. And so the fact that China was able to build a system of that order of magnitude and prove its utility for scientific applications, which is measured by this Gordon Bell Prize, uh, it was a significant accomplishment and this system was the number one on the list until two years ago when it was, a uh, year and a half ago when it was replaced by um, the, the summit system. Uh, the number four system is also in China, Tianhe 2. So if you look at the Tianhe system, this has still Intel processors here, Intel Xeons, but 
the rest of the system is built uh, internally with Chinese technology. So I think that's something important to keep in mind. And then I just want to show some colorful pictures. These are two systems in Berkeley. So Corey is the one on top, is now number 12 on the top 500 list. And the promoter system is a system that we hopefully will install in 2020. And I don't know where it will come in in terms of a list, but it is sort of order of a hundred petaflop system. So what I've said before, I just want to show on the example of the top 500 list. And if you look at the top 500 list, so there are 500 supercomputers listed from the first to the number 500 by this benchmark, the high performance Lindbeck benchmark. And what you can also look at is you can add up all the 500 systems together. That's what the blue sum line is. And if you look back, you see on a semi-log scale that these are pretty much straight lines all the way back to the early days in the early 90s. 25 years we've seen exponential growth. And that's pretty exciting and maybe just to uh, do a little quiz here that I always like to ask is I gave this presentation once to some physicists and I made the statement well there's probably no human built technology that has seen exponential growth like this over a period like 30 years and of course my physicist co colleagues corrected me and so do you know what other technology has seen exponential growth uh, yes? Maybe networking? Oh, networking, yes. But it, networking is also driven by the same Moore's law. That's true. But what they were talking about was um, particle accelerators, because the very first particle accelerators are sort of about 10 centimeters across. And the current uh, biggest particle accelerator at CERN in Geneva, uh, they are 25 kilometers across. And the energy uh, that these Xeris have has also grown on exponential rate, but uh, you can ask high energy physicists and there are sort of big questions if the high energy physics community can afford building another five to ten billion dollars accelerator like CERN has costed. And so this is another thing is, is there are of course economic limits to this growth. Anyway, uh, HPC has seen a significant <laughs> growth over the last uh, 30 years. And if you look very carefully, for example, on the orange line, which is the number 500, you see that this is not actually a linear curve. I mean, it's not a straight line, which means it's not, a, there, there have been some changes. And in particular, in 2008, the line is no longer straight. And actually, if, if you look at these two lines, from 2008 onward, the 500 uh, curve is on a different line. And so we have no longer seen in the last decade the growth of the first two or three decades. And this is the end of the dinar scaling. And uh, this is basically that you cannot make uh, the individual processors run faster and faster. So, of course, I look around, and unfortunately, I would say most of you are too young to remember this. But if you had talked to Intel in the year 2000, there were some people who boldly projected that by about 2004, there will be 4 gigahertz processors, and by 2010, there will be 10 gigahertz processors, and by now, we would have 100 gigahertz processors. And you know that the speed of processors has actually stalled, and that has been leading this is for slow the end of the NAR scaling, and this is what you see on the list reflected from 2008 onward that the 500 system is no longer going any faster. And what it means is that since the systems are no longer going that, getting that much faster, the dynamic that existed before in terms of Moore's law, that there are newer and faster systems, and that led to an acquisition of a new computer that has slowed down. So uh, right now, the computers are pretty old. And I think that's actually even true. And if you, have a, if you look at a laptop and you can ask yourself, and how old is your laptop? I'm not sure if it's uh, 
uh, as old as some of the computers on the list, but the, in a sense, the average system age on the top 500 list has gone from about uh, s uh, seven, eight months to close to 20 months. So it has almost doubled. So the systems stay around longer and there was no more incentives because the processes have gotten slower. Um, then the other thing is, is that because the process is getting slower, if you want to build bigger and bigger computers, uh, faster and faster, more powerful computers, you have to buy bigger and bigger computers. And that's why the systems have become so big and so expensive. So in my early days of managing supercomputers, $25 million was, a, in of course, 1990s dollars, a good price for a supercomputer. Now it's of the order of $100 million. And as I said, and the power consumption is going up. So uh, therefore, the top systems are all much, much bigger. So because they're less frequent purchases, you keep the system around longer so everybody is buying bigger systems. So these are some, some trends that happen in the top 500. And then you have the average performance increase in the top 500. Uh, if you take Moore's law, which is performance doubling every 18 months, if you take this, so this would be about a factor of 1.6 per year. Uh, that has held very steady until about 2012 and was actually, we've seen up to about 2010, 2011, more than Moore's Law growth. And after 2012, there's less than Moore's Law growth than what Moore's Law predicted. Now, I know I'm throwing a lot of numbers to you, so just to ask you another question, whether you're still with me here. So how did the system performance grow faster than Moore's law in the time from 94 to 2010. How was that possible? Why did systems become computationally more powerful if the individual processors increased following Moore's law by about a performance doubling every 18 months or 1.6 every year? How was that possible? Yes? Uh, mm, well, that is related to it, but uh, the impl uh, implication of this, but the shrinking led to more transistors per chip, and then the more transistors were used for multi-core processors. So the first growth was because of parallelism. So the systems became more and more parallel. So now, as Moore's law is pretty much slowing down, I'll spend some more time on it, the systems are no longer... Uh, they're still growing in parallelism, but the basic Moore's law growth is no longer moving the top 500 forward, and it's not moving forward the computing industry in general. So, the, if you go back to this chart and you look at the top curve, uh, there were predictions in 2010 or so that we're just looking at the straight line and say by 2020, will have an exaflop and uh, the uh, and I looked at this and I said no that's not going to happen because we cannot solve the power consumption problem and I bet with my colleague Thomas Lippert who is running a supercomputing center in Jülich in Germany and we bet and I said there will be no exaflop computer by 2020 and he said, yes, there will be one. And we bet $2,000 versus 2,000 euro. <laughs> and this was, of course, 2010 or 2011 when the euro crisis and the Greek currency uh, problems were. So we're also doing currency hedging because uh, he thought dollars would be a better deal. And I thought euro is a better deal. And I win it on both counts because the <laughs> euro is still higher than the dollars. And I don't think there's going to be an exaflop system. So <laughs> uh, this is, you got to look at these curves carefully because they are not, they look like straight lines, but they're not. But just generally, it is a really bad idea if you have exponential growth and you extrapolate exponential growth into the future because a small perturbation, and you should know this if you 
try to fit an exponential curve to a couple of data, uh, you just make a small perturbation and you get very different growth rates. And so this is exactly what the problem is here, that the people who said, oh, we excess scale by 2020, no problem, they were wrong on this. So as I said, we had this one and then 2013, actually also for top slowdown, and this was what I think was for Moore's Law slowdown, and this is really the projected development, and you see that these different curves lead to very big different projections if you look into the early 20s. And in particular, the top one system cannot be better than the 500, all 500 systems to combine. You see that these projections need to be looked at very carefully. Now, one thing I just very briefly want to say is, as I said, the interest of different countries in high-performance computing and supercomputing is also measured in the top 500, and China not only has built the number three and four system, but China also has uh, caught up with the volume of systems in the top 500, and now has more supercomputers actually produced per in the last list than the United States has, which is a big change. And uh, there are three Chinese vendors, Lenovo, which is actually was the former IBM, uh, basically cluster architecture, and uh, Inspur and Sugon, and those three companies are domestically in China very successful in selling systems. So you see here two things is also the growth of the domestic Chinese market for high performance computing and the growth of the Chinese manufacturers. And this is one of my predictions is, is that so Lenovo sells internationally, but I would expect Sugon and Inspur to sell their systems uh, also internationally very soon. So uh, the most likely in the world marketplace that would end up would be probably in uh, rapidly developing countries. So if you look at places like say maybe Indonesia or Vietnam, you might see instead of an HP system, you might see Chinese systems being sold there. So this is just another factor that is the international competitiveness that helps in high-performance computing. <coughs> I've shown this already on the averages. So I want to talk a little bit about Moore's Law that uh, you probably have heard about. This was the statement uh, that uh, Gordon Moore made in the late 60s and said that he expects the number of transistors per chip will be doubling. And he said every 1.5 to 2 years, and then the industry settled about every um, performance doubling every 18 months. And this has been the same for over 50 years. Now, Moore's law is an economic law. And it's driven, and I'll show you a little slide later on, on by the fact that uh, there was a very virtuous cycle of investment that, re uh, that reinforced Moore's Law and reinforced the fact that every couple of years, big companies like Intel could make the big investments to build new semiconductor fabs and to produce the fast and faster chips with more and more transistors per chip and faster, smaller line width. Now, the question is, and there has been a lot of debate about the end of Moore's Law, and I would say that probably until about two or three years ago, Intel would have, did not want to say this at all, and I remember that a colleague of mine uh, organized a panel discussion, a conference about the end of Moore's Law, and he had somebody from Intel coming to the panel, and then the Intel participant had to cancel out last minute because Intel did not want to even have a panelists to talk on a panel about the end of Moore's Law. Now, 